Stacks and grids are two powerful layout tools that help us arrange elements in our designs. They're both used to create flexible and responsive layouts, but they differ a bit in functionality and are suited to slightly different use cases. In the previous lesson, we talked about stacks, but now let's talk about how grids compare and get comfortable with the basics of how they work. Let's start with a high level look at the difference between stacks and grids. As we learned in the previous lessons, stacks are used to arrange elements in either a vertical column or a horizontal row, one or the other. Great for simple layouts where you want items to flow in a single direction. Stacks automatically handle spacing, alignment, and distribution of their child elements, making it easy to create consistent layouts. If you're familiar with HTML and CSS, stacks are based on Flexbox. Grids, on the other hand, offer a more complex and structured way to arrange elements in a two-dimensional layout with both rows and columns. So grids are great for layouts where we need to distribute and align elements both horizontally and vertically. Think more complex layouts like dashboards, image galleries, and even feature bentos, because grids allow us to decide how many rows or columns an item spans across. In the world of HTML and CSS, grids are based on CSS grid, but a bit simplified in Framer to make them easier to work with. Let's look at how to create a grid layout. Much like stacks, we can start with any old frame, add a layout on the properties panel, then just switch the layout from stack to grid. Alternatively, we can draw a frame with a grid layout already applied using the grid tool in the layout menu of the toolbar, or by pressing shift G on the keyboard, then clicking and dragging to draw our grid. Before we go any further, let's look at the anatomy of a grid. When we're looking at a grid like this one, it looks like we have two structural levels to the hierarchy, the parent frame with the grid layout applied to it, and the immediate child layers of the grid, which flow left to right, top to bottom. Let's call these grid items. But there's actually a third thing going on in between. What makes this frame a grid in the first place is that it contains invisible rows and columns that form invisible grid cells, which behave like containers and hold each grid item. These containers might be invisible, but they're very real because when we decide how to size and position each grid item, we're doing so in relation to these invisible containers. So naturally, we got to acknowledge they exist. In this example, I've made a slightly bigger grid with 12 frames inside as grid items for us to play with. Each one is set to fill the height and width of its cell, which makes it really easy to see the size and shape of each cell. Now let's play with the properties of the grid itself. By default, grids have a fixed number of rows and columns. I say by default because under the advanced settings, you'll actually find a toggle to switch between having a fixed number of columns or automatically cramming in as many columns as will fit into the available space. We're not gonna dig too far into the advanced settings in this lesson. Just know that these settings are here for you and might be worth exploring depending on what you're trying to build. With one of these fixed grids, we get to choose how many columns and rows we want. When we change the number of columns, the number of rows will actually adjust automatically to make room for all the grid items. We can add or remove rows, but can't create too few rows for the number of grid items we have. This also makes it easy to override the number of columns to fit better in smaller breakpoints without having to worry about doing the math for the right number of rows. In fact, if we add more grid items later, additional rows will get added automatically. You'll notice that as we add more rows, each row is shrinking to make room. If we go to the advanced settings, we can see why this is happening. By default, height is set to fill container, which means all of these rows are trying to grow to fill the height of the grid frame. We can also set a fixed height or choose to fit the height of the content of each row, but we don't really have any content at the moment that can support the height of each row, so I'll leave this set to fill container. On that note, much like stacks, it's possible to create a sizing conflict between the height of the grid itself and its rows, or between the height of the rows and the content that's within them. You may remember this from the previous lesson that fit content can conflict with fill sizing, since someone has to be in charge of the size or else the layout collapses in on itself. The same phenomenon is at play with grids. If the height of the whole grid is set to fit content, the height of the rows can't be set to fill container. Similarly, the height of a grid item can't be set to fill if the rows themselves are set to fit content, just like with stacks. 
Okay, back to the basic properties. Again, similar to stacks, grids allow us to define the gaps between things. We get a single field to determine the gaps between both the columns and the rows. Then padding allows us to add a cushion of space around the inside of the grid frame. Again, just like stacks. Another similarity between stacks and grids is that we can click and drag items to rearrange them. We also get these nice little control handles we can drag to avoid grabbing the wrong layer by mistake. Or we can rearrange layers on the layers panel and even use the arrow keys to nudge the selected layer up or down the sorting order. The immediate child layers of a grid, again, we'll call these grid items, occupy those invisible grid cells I mentioned. But where things get interesting is that we can decide how many columns and rows they span across. You can even make a grid item span the full width of the grid by choosing all columns. We can still drag to rearrange things visually and change the sorting order, and the grid will adjust. This is what makes grids a great choice for creating bento layouts, or any grid layout for that matter where some items need to be given more real estate than others. Okay, so that changed the size of the invisible cell container that the grid item occupies. Then we also get to decide the size and position of the grid item within that container. We have our usual sizing options of fixed, relative, fill, and fit content. You can see that with fill, the layer fills the entire width or height of the invisible cell container it occupies. But when we change a dimension to fixed or relative, its size can now differ from its container, which gives us a new position control to decide how the element will be aligned within the container. You might be thinking, can I switch to absolute positioning to move this around wherever I want inside the cell? Remember what happens when we switch a child of a stack to absolute positioning? It removes it from the flow of the stack. Same thing happens with grids. If you do need to get some absolute position layers within a grid cell, you can leave the immediate child layer of the grid set to relative and nest absolute layers within that. So now you've got an idea of how grids differ from stacks and why in some cases you may want to use a grid layout instead. With both stacks and grids in your tool set, you'll be ready to tackle just about any layout you set out to create. There are just a few more sizing and positioning modes for us to look at in the next couple of lessons. I'll see you there.